It's another edition of the Prime Time News Bulletin here on Joy News on Multi TV. Coming up, electricity tariffs are to go up by 146%, with water also going up by 97% in new tariffs approved by the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission. Clossack threatens nationwide demonstration on by October 14th over a failure by government to settle their top up premiums. Mass grave at Awudume Cemetery here in Accra sets off an offensive stench residents say is unbearable. Anglo Gold Ashanti, Goldfields Ghana and five others indicted in EPA report for their poor environmental practices. And Cocoa Board signs agreement for $1.2 billion to finance cocoa purchases. We also have sports showbiz and international news all coming up. News at 8 with Israel Live. In our very first story, customers of the electricity company of Ghana would have to brace themselves to pay more than two times what they currently pay for electricity, whilst those who have water running through their taps will see a doubling of their bills. The 146% increase in electricity tariffs and 97% for water were approved by the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission after an extensive campaign by the utilities which has been largely opposed by the consuming public who say the companies don't deserve the increases. The PRC has ever pledged the utilities this time will be forced to deliver quality service to their customers. The Electricity Company of Ghana and the Ghana Water Company Limited have been pushing for the increases they say have become critical because they can barely survive and meet the operation on the revenue streams generated from the current tariffs. In approving their request, the PURC has had to conduct several stakeholders' consultative fora to hear from the utility forums as well as other stakeholders, including customers. Communications Director of the PURC, Nana Yajantua, explains um, the Commission, in arriving at the new tariff, had to take into consideration, among others, the fact that the time the utilities got an increase was three years ago. At this moment, what we are seeing is a uh, 100, around 149 for uh, electricity and about 97 for water. So electricity meaning VRA, great coal, ECG is an average. And this kind of percentage represents how much revenue the three utilities would need to get adequate money to be able to do their work. And mainly I'm talking about their operations and their maintenance costs. And looking at the period of th three years, certain factors, market-driven and macroeconomic factors, have affected the tariff tremendously. The utility service providers need some amount of money, apart from their own operations, to even shore up their balance sheet to enable them to borrow some money from the bank. She, however, insists the utilities would be held to strict performance standards. The PURC is going to assure the public that whichever way it goes, um, with the figures that we are seeing, the PURC would ensure that there is adequate quality of service, some level commensurate to the increases that we are mentioning. Um, it is key for every consumer to get the right kind of service if they are paying the tariff. Nanaya Ajantua could not say when the new tariffs would kick in, but says they are hoping to publish them soon. Meanwhile, the electricity company of Ghana says it is satisfied with the approved tariffs. What this largely means to ECG is that it's going to uh, cater for our operational costs. We'll be able to pay, for, uh, to pay our suppliers and then also have enough to run our operations. Um, in the event that what we have asked for, the 166%, is not granted in full. What it will also mean to ECG is that we need to now uh, stagger some project implementation to make sure that at least in future these projects will be taken on board and executed accordingly. The company, he says, is however concerned about how the new tariffs will be ruled out. This tariff adjustment is also being structured in a three-year 
uh, uh, process. So what it means is that there will be some adjustment today and then it will be staggered over the period. So as and when we are moving on, we wouldn't get back to this situation where tariffs will, be, will require tar a huge tariff adjustments and all that. When we reached for their reaction, officials of the Ghana Water Company Limited said they would comment after the new tariffs are published. The Civil and Local Government Staff Association of Ghana, CLOSAG, has threatened a nationwide strike beginning October 14 if payments of the top up premiums of its members are not settled by that date. CLOSAG says this decision follows a breakdown in talks with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and the National Labour Commission to resolve the matter. We have patiently subjected ourselves to the procedures laid down in the Labour Act. 203 at 651 for settlement of industrial disputes. Having gone through the mediation process without success, the National Labor Commission informed the parties involved, that's Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and CLOSAC, that it had referred the matter to voluntary arbitration in line with the dispute settlement procedures. Unfortunately, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission unilaterally term terminated the process by withdrawing. The executives say their strike action is the in conformity with Section 159-2003 of the Labor Act 651. Well, we went to, we looked at the Act, and the Act is saying that at, during the process, if there is any termination by either party, the other party can embark on a strike. So this is a legal strike that we are embarking on. They added that the strike will persist for as long as the market premiums of members are unpaid. Now, the Public Affairs Officer of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, uh, Al Ankara, he joins us on the phone lines with a quick response to the threat by uh, Klosa. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening to you, Mr. Yang. Uh, unfortunately, we have lost uh, Lankra on the line. We'll try and reach him, but uh, in other news, the National Road Safety Commission has described as unacceptable the number of pedestrian deaths that occur on the country's roads. According to the commission, close to half of the victims are pedestrians. The situation, it says, is frightening and should be tackled immediately. Road transport is the dominating mode of transportation in Ghana. It accounts for 95% of the transportation of passengers and goods across the country. The number of deaths on the country's roads, according to the National Road Safety Commission, is assuming an alarming proportion and calls for serious concerns. The statistics reveal that pedestrians are the worst affected in road traffic fatalities countrywide, with central regions' pedestrian fatalities higher than the national average. Speaking at a workshop organized for three regions by the local government service in the National Road Safety Commission, the acting director of the National Road Safety Commission, May Aubrey Yabwa, bemoaned the increasing rate in which pedestrians are losing their lives on the country's roads. Passengers are the most vulnerable on our roads. That is the car or vehicle occupants. But statistics from us showed clearly, so clearly, that uh, pedestrians are the most vulnerable in our country. Over 40% of those who die on our roads are pedestrians. A lot of them, about 80% of these are those who are crossing the roads. This shows clearly that all of us are vulnerable because at one time or the other we are pedestrians. And therefore, we need to do something about pedestrian safety in our country. The statistics also reveal that road traffic crashes that lead to fatalities have serious repercussions on families as they lose their breadwinners. May Obriyabwa wants the trend stemmed. Male deaths on our road is about 70 percent and the female who die are about 30 percent. And this has shown since 1991 to date 
We have statistics from 1991 to date, and consistently it has been 70% uh, or even more for males as compared to females. This shows us clearly that the males, which we all know most of them are the breadwinners in our country, are dying through road traffic crashes. And we have also said that the deaths through road traffic crashes are far higher than even uh, what we see as a criminal death, the, the armed robbery, even malaria, HIV, AIDS, etc. So if 70% of those who are breadwinners in our country are dying, that are the males, then it tells us that we have to do something very serious. It is in this light that the Metropolitan, Municipal and District Assemblies have been brought together to help mainstream road safety into the programs of the assemblies. According to the National Road Safety Commission, guidelines for the program have already been prepared by the National Road Safety Commission and the local government service secretariat to guide them in the adoption of road safety into their activities. Richard Kujunyaku filed this report from the central region. All right, we return to our earlier story on the strike threat by the uh, Civil and uh, Local Government Staff Association of Ghana. We're joined on the line now by the Public Affairs Officer of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, uh, El Ankara. But before we get to him, we would like to play back a bit of what the Klos of what Klosag has been saying about the strike threat. The procedures laid down in the Labour Act. 203 at 651 for settlement of industrial disputes. Having gone through the mediation process without success, the National Labor Commission informed the parties involved, that's Fair Wages and Salaries Commission and CLOSAC, that it had referred the matter to voluntary arbitration in line with the dispute settlement procedures. Unfortunately, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission unilaterally terminated the process by withdrawing. The executive say. So that was just for the benefit of the Public Affairs Officer of the uh, uh, Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, who's on the line. Uh, so, El Ankara, you just heard uh, the executive of CLOSAC uh, saying that you terminated the process midway. What's your reaction to that? Isla, thank you for the opportunity. Um, um, maybe over this weekend, I will um, encourage you to get the newsroom, your newsroom, to go into the single spine pay policy. We search everywhere and find out if you um, find the, discover anything called top of allowance. It does not exist. Let me repeat that. Is, 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 it, so, is it that it has never come up on the table for discussion? It has at all? come up several times, and we have made our position clear several times. And if it, if it comes up a hundred more times, we'll make that position clear a hundred more times. Is, is, that, is, is that, that why the fair wages and salaries? Out. Is that why the fair wages and salaries would have walked out of this uh, supposed meeting? Walking out is a harsh phrase to do. I mean, walking out means we were in the middle of a conversation, of a discussion or a negotiation of some sort, and then we walked out. We never went into negotiations with a uh, club that on anything called top of allowance. When they brought up the, the issue of top of allowance, they said it does not exist, so we can't create it and give it to them. In any case, if there were any allowance, there are category one allowances which have been consolidated into their salary. There are category two three allowances which are at the higher level at public services joint standing negotiations, which are yet to be brought on board. So this idea called top of allowance. It's, it, it, it's non existent. And so we never went into negotiation. We, we have said it does not exist. Israel, how do we sit down to negotiate it in the first place? It does not exist. That's what we told them. What's we the went to the National Labor Commission. And then we went through, we actually initially were resisting this idea of negotiation. We said, the Labor Commission said, we should go there and table our position to them. So we went to that mediation and table our position that top up allowance does not exist. We cannot create a new one. And then they are pushing us into the arbitration thing. And as it, uh, the, the Labour Act that they quoted said, uh, the two parties must have started a certain negotiation. They must have reached the deadlock. And then they will agree, they will both agree that we are going for um, voluntary arbitration. No, L, 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 as far as they're concerned, uh, something was started. And as far as they're concerned, they're going on, uh, on, on 
the strike, they're starting a strike October 14. Is there any compromise at all you're contemplating, or it's for you to no no? Uh, let me let me uh, let me eliminate this whole thing about strike action. There would be a salary commission that not manage strike action. Uh, strike action is uh, with our job and our mandate is about compensation management. We manage we manage public service seven salaries in this country. We don't manage strike. So if they go on strike, there is nothing we can do about it. Yeah, um, management will have to deal with that. Secondly, we can never say that because the group is on strike, we will make any compromises on uh, the principles of the single strike pay policy. Uh, if they go on strike, I don't know how, for how long that strike will be. It will not change that principle that there is no such thing as top up allowance. We will not recreate. We will not create a new one, and the strike action will not just fair with this and uh, create any allowance cost of up allowance. If they will just make decisions based on strike action, then everybody might as well go on strike to. Um, uh, exact, exact, uh, whatever they want from service and salary company. Okay. So, Cluster, if their executives are listening, we want to repeat what we've been telling them in the boardrooms and the meetings that there is no such thing as top up allowance. And let me remind them, um, and in case it's unfortunate that uh, the executives, their leaders, don't tell the members the truth and they draw them into unnecessary strike action. But let me talk directly to the membership of Cluster across the country that we said to them that there is no such top up allowance. And so we've never, for something that does not exist, it is erroneous to say that we have started any negotiations. Indeed, if we agree that it exists, then we can start the uh, negotiations on it. So we said it does not exist. They took us to the National Labor Commission. We told National Labor Commission that. National Labor Commission said it does not matter. Let's just come to the negotiation and put our position down. Okay. And then it looks like a trap. But okay. once you come to uh, mediation, you have to be forced into uh, application. We said, no, according to the labor law, before you get into um, voluntary administration, both parties would must have started a certain negotiation, a deadlock must have come, and indeed both parties must have All right. that we are going for, for that administration. Okay. That's not a thing. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, and, and, and let me yeah. just put in one thing there, that if they indeed said, okay, we, uh, this is what the labor law, or the labor access, and we are, we are um, not even to it, the next thing is to take it to a higher court. It is not about uh, going on strike to get that, that, that thing resolved. We will not take any action based on strike action. That's not All right. Thank you very much. Alankra is with the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission. And the huge one is to uh, seek their position, state their position on the strike threats by uh, Klosak. In other news, President John Mahama is set to join other world leaders at the United Nations General Assembly meeting in New York to discuss post millennium development goals, new targets for the world. With the 2015 MDGs approaching, the world leaders will be looking at what else they can do to make life better for people in their respective countries. Information Minister Mahama Ayariga told journalists at a daily media briefing President Mahama will also have the opportunity to address the UN General Assembly of Heads of States next week, Thursday. We are approaching 2015 and the world leaders will be meeting in New York to, among other things, discuss the post-MDG world, what new targets we should set for ourselves based on the progress made in several countries. President John Dramani Mahama will be joining other world leaders at the General Assembly uh, next week to continue to work towards fashioning a post-MDG world in addition to uh, other activities that will take place in New York. He says while in the United States, President Mahama will also hold several other meetings with Ghanaians, business groups and deliver a lecture. Uh, there will be a private sector investment in Africa meeting um, which will be hosted by uh, Ex-President Obasanjo and attended by high-level um, business community in New York. His Excellency the President will participate in those meetings. That will be a reception hosted by President Barack Obama. The President will be at the reception. And um, there will be a UNDP World Bank uh, event to discuss the, how to accelerate progress towards the MDG. The president will depart the U.S. on the 2nd of October, but will make a brief stop in the United Kingdom before he returns to Ghana on the 6th of October. News coming up. Don't go away.
Anglo Gold Ashanti Goldfields Ghana, Golding Star Resources and four other companies have been named amongst mining firms with the worst environmental practices in Ghana. The seven companies, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, failed to comply with requirements of the law with respect to the disposal of their toxic effluents. The best performing out of the 16 assessed by the EPA's Akobeng program were Shirano Gold and Ghana Manganese. The Akoben program is an initiative to single out for praise companies that comply with the country's environmental protection laws or where it applies name and shame, those who don't. The 16 major companies that are assessed and scored from red for poor through orange, blue, green and gold for excellence. None of the firms scored gold, two scored green, two scored blue, five scored orange and seven scored red. Director General of the EPA explains the survey paints a worrying picture about mining firms' regard for the environment in communities where they operate. This year we've had two greens, meaning very good, two blues, meaning good, and we've also had rating showing five meaning satisfactory and seven meaning bad. Where we have had bad is because one, they've not complied with the legal requirement for the country. Two, they have released toxic chemicals into the environment, which we say should not be the case. We want zero releases into the environment. But once you release once, it's enough for us as a regulatory body to say your performance is bad. Deputy Minister of Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation, Dr. Helu Duku, in a speech read on her behalf, says government has a plan to publicly recognize companies that perform well on World Environment Day. We want to encourage mining companies operating in Ghana to maintain a high level of environmental performance and stay current on international best practices. I want to congratulate the entire ACUBEN team of the Environmental Protection Agency for undertaking the complex tax of environmental data collection, site audits, and analysis of ratings. The categories used in assessing the 16 companies include legal issues, hazardous waste management, toxic and non-toxic releases, monitoring and reporting, and corporate social responsibility. Incidentally, almost all the mining firms performed excellently in the discharge of their corporate social responsibility. Our right, news just coming in is that there's been a, a, there's a tanker that's that's on fuel tanker that's on fire somewhere uh, at Chito Awudome in the Volta region. We're joined on the line now by uh, an eyewitness at the place. He's called Kweku Hamond. He is actually the chief operating officer of uh, uh, Choice FM. He joins us online. Good evening to you, uh, sir. Good evening, Israel. How? What can you tell us about this uh, this fire? Um, actually, we uh, we got to somewhere after Sanga, and then driving towards Chito, where then we noticed that there was a long, about two kilometers of stagnant, non-moving vehicles. So we actually went a little bit further, and then we noticed that there was a tanker that was up in flames. Um, I'm certain for a fact that it was because of some heavy rain that was actually pouring right for, uh, from the Adomi Bridge. So I'm sure the driver lost control. Okay. And at the moment, it's caused about three kilometers of traffic and people are not moving out of hole and nobody can also get into hole. I, do you know if uh, anybody has died in this fire at all? Um, now, not to the best of my knowledge, but then it looks like uh, the accident happened after a period of about 15 minutes before the tanker went up in flames. So I'm certain the drivers and everybody might have gotten out of it before this happened. 
Okay. All right. So what you would need now, I guess, is for the police uh, to get to the area to control the traffic situation. Or they probably are already there. The police are already here, but then um, typical Ghanaians as we are, everybody is driving towards to see what exactly is happening. And that is what something that we should all try to avoid. There's an accident. People are, um, there's a trunk tanker up in flames. All we need to do is that we need to drive off the scene. But people are not. And you know, with these things, normally what can happen is that if it touches one car, it's going to be just a run through yeah. of all the vehicles on the stretch. Yeah. So what we need the police to do is that they should come in quickly. They are there, but then we need reinforcement. Okay. And also the fire service from Ho should come in immediately. Um, it's something that we can avert any serious disaster if these things are done immediately. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Kweku Hamond. He is the chief operating officer uh, of uh, Choice FM, but he is presently at the scene of a fire, fuel tanker, which is on fire at Chito Awudome in the Volta region. Uh, here in Accra, a mass grave at the Awudome Cemetery has got residents in the vicinity of the cemetery complaining about a foul stench that has engulfed the area. The grave is said to contain decomposing carcasses from mortuaries in the capital. Joy News has learned the mass grave was dug nine days ago and only yesterday received another consignment of fresh corpses. There was a strong smell of disinfectant wafting through the air around the cemetery, one of Accra's major burial grounds at the time the news team got there. It had, however, not been very successful at diffusing the stench. The pit itself was partially covered, apparently following a report on Joy FM. There were no caretakers at the cemetery to speak to, and residents were unwilling to speak on camera except for this young man, who agreed to speak only if his identity would be protected. He told Joy News the mass burials are regularly conducted. <laughs> Okay. Okay. The carcasses are said to have been dispatched from the Kolibu Teaching Hospital mortuary. The hospital, however, says they are not solely responsible. I know on, on, on that the police hospital and the police hospital buried. Mm. And I understand district to Department of Anatomy has also buried mm. at Audubon mm. Cemetery. But you know the other side. Usually all this are done by the AMA. They will have to, they will dig the grave. So once the uh, police mortuary, police mortuary, or test service mortuary, any other mortuary, they uh, 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 send their bodies there, mm. then the, the, the rest lies there. The Health Directorate of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly is meanwhile challenging claims the mass graves were not properly attended to. Under no circumstance would a burial, any, any burial will be done and it will not be covered. So uh, the, what happens is a, a mass grave is a big grave excavated mm. and a uh, once a, a certain number of people are buried, it is covered. It is covered up to a point, and then the rest is left for some time. We are public health people, but we no implication for burying without covering. Mm. So they, they, under no circumstance would we uh, give orders for them to bury a consignment, a bury a consignment of bodies, and not covering it.
Four women are being held by the police in the Yapa West region for allegedly burning a one-month-old baby in a kitchen at Tokali. The quartet, whose names were not given out by the police for security reasons, were picked up following complaints by the mother of the deceased. Rafiq Salam reports from where. According to the acting Upper West Public Relations Officer of the Ghana Police Service, ASP Edmond Yamiche, a month-old baby was put in the room by her mother, Amina Abdullahi, whilst attending nature's call. After a while, she heard some unusual noise from people screaming that her house was on fire. She quickly came out to find her one-month-old baby, Faiza Abdullahi, who was left in the room, rather, in the kitchen, and the kitchen set ablaze. The baby cannot crawl, so it's very mysterious, uh, finding this baby in the kitchen. So we're suspecting foul play that uh, somebody might have uh, sent the baby there. Uh, this baby was uh, halfway bent and then uh, the rush uh, head to the hospital and uh, she died uh, two days after. The baby was quickly rushed to the Wai Regional Hospital on Tuesday, but passed away on Thursday. The body of the deceased was taken to the Wai Regional Hospital morgue for autopsy, after which she was buried under strict Islamic tradition. ASP Nyamiche said the police at Wichiao have started investigation to unravel the mystery surrounding the death of the one-month-old baby and those found culpable would be punished. This time we have not been able to establish uh, uh, what, what the cause or the truth in it. So we are still uh, conducting our investigation and then I know uh, surely we shall uh, uh, come to the bottom of the issue. Rafik Salam's report from WA. The food and agriculture... <laughs> Hello then, welcome to Joy Business. My name is Abigail Adomako Enchi. Now, production of crude oil in the Jubilee field has been suspended for the next 21 days. The partners are shutting down the vessel used in collecting the crude oil for the next three weeks for maintenance works. Some have argued that the period for the works is abnormal as the country could be losing millions in tax revenue. But investor relations and communications manager at Salo, Benis Nachi, has told Joy Business this would not be the case because the activity was planned. Now, economist Moses Asaga is likely to over from Alex Mould as Chief Executive of the National Petroleum Authority, NPA. Joy Business gathers the former Minister of Employment and Labor Relations has been shortlisted to soon head the institution. The Energy Ministry yesterday confirmed the appointment of Alex Mould as Acting Chief Executive of Ghana National Petroleum Corporation. Mr. Mould takes over from Nana Bwache Asafwejai, who has been asked to proceed on leave and return to the Ministry of Energy for reassignment. Moses Asaga was a member of Parliament for NABDAM in the Upper West Region from 1996 to 2012. He holds an MSc in Petroleum Engineering from the University of Aberdeen and MBA from Yonsei University, South Korea. Now to some more stories, Ghana Cocoa Board has signed an agreement with the Consortium of International Financiers for the release of $1.2 billion to finance cocoa purchases for the 2013-2014 crop season. The facility which was signed in Paris, France was once again oversubscribed and is the largest soft commodity deal in sub-Saharan Africa. It is however less than the $1.5 billion raised last year. The trade finance facility is aimed at ensuring that cocoa farmers in Ghana are paid fairly and promptly for their cocoa produce. Federico Toragano, Managing Director at Societe General Corporate Investment Banking, commended Coco Board for putting in place good management and financial structures that are giving the bank's trust to continue to raise the funds for Coco Board. 
Anthony Fofia, chief executive of Cocoa Board, expressed his sincere gratitude to the banks which facilitated the syndication and assured them that the board will continue to strive to promote the sustainable development of the cocoa sector such that the livelihood of cocoa farmers are enhanced through pragmatic policies and program interventions. Lubo to commenced on the Alubo to Aguna Junction Road in the Western Region in affirmation of government's commitment to the Trans Ecowas Highway, which will link Lagos to several cities in the sub region, including Accra to Abidjan. The highway will be a six lane dual carriageway. The Roads and Highways Minister Amin Suleimani, who disclosed this to join you, says the plan will involve the expansion of the Accra Tamamuta Way into eight lanes with interchanges. As part of preparations to kickstart the 1,028-kilometer road project intended to connect Lagos, Accra, Kutonu, Lome and Abidjan, ministers of roadworks and infrastructure from the five ECOWAS member states met with experts in the field to finalize plans. Experts, after a four-day consultative meeting, could not come up with the concrete cost of the project, but say it will hover around 2 to $3 billion after some feasibility studies. Development partners are to assist member states in its funding, but the sector minister says Ghana is already showing it is committed. We have a construction run from uh, Elubu to Aguna Junction, that's part of the uh, Trans Highway, and uh, you know that Akashi is already we are working there already, and uh, we have preparations to do other works on the Accra Takradi, and uh, on our own here we propose to do uh, uh, an additional uh, uh, two lanes on the motorway that will making it uh, a four lane uh, uh, or, or, or an eight lane carriage. We propose to do that now with interchanges, modifying the Tatakwashi and then doing an interchange at the Tama site of the, uh, the, the Tama roundabout. So that's what we propose to do now. So along the line, they will carry it along with the um, project. For member states, such projects to promote regional integration and trade is long overdue. Over the years, our leaders have talked about regional integration, and there is nothing on ground to point to that direction, or rather to indicate that as a, as a sub-region, we are serious with regional integration. This is the first major step by our presidents and heads of government to bring about regional integration in the west coast of Africa. And that is why we are passionate about driving this project to, to a successful end. The five heads of states and government will meanwhile receive the full detail of the project to start in 2014 at the next ECOWAS summit slated for October this year. And it's a wrap for business. My name is Abigail Adomakoenchi. A cell of suspected Islamist militants has opened fire on security forces in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. The clash occurred at the location of a suspected Boko Haram weapons cache. Boko Haram is most active in northeastern Nigeria, where a state of emergency was imposed in May. Attacks in the northeast have increased recently, despite a massive military deployment to the worst affected areas. In the latest incident in Borno State, officials said at least 87 people had been killed by militants who disguised themselves in military uniforms at a checkpoint outside the town of Benishe. They shot dead those trying to flee. The group wants to create an Islamic state across Nigeria and has waged a deadly insurgency since 2009. The attack near Benishek took place on Tuesday, but news of it was slow to emerge as all phone lines had been cut off in an effort to help the military offensive. Agriko says it plans to try ex-First Lady Simone Gbagbo in its own court instead of handing the case to the International Criminal Court. The wife of former President Laurent Gbagbo is being prosecuted for alleged crimes against humanity following disputed presidential polls in 2010. 
Ivory Coast ministers on Friday voted to dismiss the ICC's arrest warrant. Simone Gbagbo has been charged with crimes against humanity in Ivory Coast. Some 3,000 people died in violence after Mr. Gbagbo's husband refused to accept defeat in a runoff vote. Laurent Gbagbo is already awaiting trial at the ICC in The Hague on four charges of crimes against humanity. Gbagbo, 67, insists he is innocent. He is the first former head of state to have appeared at the ICC. That's it for international news. An association where smile, you've got to go. There's a reason more and more people are connecting with Tigo's Go Unlimited Internet. <laughs> it's not just because they get to post more, chat more, <laughs> laugh more. It's because they always get to take their friends along with them. How many? One, please. Now Star 500 hash to purchase an unlimited daily, weekly or monthly internet plan and stay connected for as long as you want. Smile, you've got to go. Time for the very latest in the world of sports. The stage is set for the biggest game on the local football scene as rivals Accra Hearts, Seville and Kumasiya Santikotoko face off at the Crossword Stadium this Sunday in the second week fixture of the ongoing Ghana Premier League. Both clubs got off to a perfect start to the new season. Kotoko tamed the Drianna Stars 2 1 in Tsunyane, whilst Accra Hearts, Seville defeated New Edubiasi 2 0 at Bekwai. Some football pundits have been speaking to Joy Sports ahead of the Super Clash. Hearts of Oak have carried brilliant form into this season. I mean, they've been excellent in the second round. They were by far the best team. And the 2 0 win over New Adibiasi proved brilliant. Komasi Asante Kotoko also started quite well, winning a difficult match at home to Adriana Stars. They might they drew last season at home. It's going to be difficult to determine who will win this particular match because both teams, in my opinion, look evenly matched. But for, for me, what I'm expecting is quality football from the two teams. You know, when you talk about El Clasico, when you go to Europe, uh, Manchester United playing against Liverpool, you look at the quality of football that they have That is what I'm expecting them to do on Sunday. Technical issues, support base, uh, their form in terms of the field of play doesn't all work. Uh, House of Folk and Kumasa Sadikodoko have always been who has the character to win the match and that is exactly what I'm going to uh, expect on Sunday. But the team that will perform very well, that will take his chances, that is going to win the match on Sunday. But in my opinion, I think that this is a, a match that is way too close to call and if any of the two teams are going to win, it might probably be down to a mistake by the other side, but I'm looking at a draw here. So what's your prediction for that game between Hearts of Oak and Kumasi Asante Kotoko? We'll be live on Super Sports after the seal, a three-year deal with the Ghana Football Association. Now, the Kettings will be drawn on the second season of the Kalbank Beach Soccer League this weekend. The Novelty Beach Soccer League, which began in May, will see 10 games on it to mark the final day of both the Championship and Division 1. Adar Showans and Keta Sansa Sports are in contention for the title while East Ligon Sharks and Nungwa United are drawn in the precarious relegation battle. Member of the communication team of the Ghana Beach Soccer Association, Ellis Niboni, has been speaking to Joy Sports. It has been an amazing season, it has been a great season for us because we can compare it to the first season and then this is the second season. And then also we can even divide this season into two, before Morocco and after Morocco. Last season it was, it was really a rosary for Keita Sunset, but this season it has been a tough season because they've had challenges from Laioka, from Walk Bear, from Adan Assurance and other Nungwa, as I can tell you. And then it, it's been amazing if you look at the top there, um, Sunset is losing by just three goals and then Adan is closely following them and it, it's a dindo affair it's going straight to the wire at the top there and if you come to the bottom there too it's really going to the wire because um, East Legon Sharks and Nungwa are battling for the relegation position who is going and who is staying yeah. Yeah. all arrangements has been made and all is set for Saturday it's going to be um, one of those moments at the beach where you wouldn't want to sit in the house and be told but then you have to be there and see things for yourself Right, that'll be all for sports tonight. My name is George Adi Jr. Do you have a good night and have a great weekend? Israel joins us with Chobis.
Sports was brought to you in association with... Now, why would anybody want to charge an entry fee for his or her birthday party? Well, a poster is circulating on the internet indicating the Ghana's female representative of the just-ended Big Brother Africa reality show, The Chase, is throwing a birthday bash and is charging 50 and 100 CDs for entry. How reliable is this information? According to the poster, Sally's birthday party comes off next Friday, September 27, and is expected to feature a number of her BBA housemates, including Chase winner Dillish, South Africa's Angelo, the famous Nando, who allegedly had sex with her in the BBA house, among others. Now, it really sounds like a star-studded birthday bash in the offing, but if the poster is anything to go by, then fans of the former BBA Chase housemate will have to part with Sam Cash at the gate of the Excel Lounge. Now, 50 CDs to be precise if you are entering as a mere fan, but if you want a VIP treat, then you should be ready to pay 100 CDs at the gate. And who knows, that might come with some photo ops. Again, the poster indicates that BBA All-Stars winner Uti Nwachuku will be the MC for the occasion. Maybe the tallest of BBA stars might have prompted the charging of the fee. One can never tell. But Showbiz will get some answers for you in our subsequent bulletins. Well, following the news that Sally will be charging gay feats of 50 and 100 Ghana cities for a birthday bash next Friday, we hit the streets to find out from the public if they would like to pay to be at their star started party. Uh, paying to be at a birthday party, to me, I don't think it's really sensible. Unless you are a, a, a kind of celebrity or something. Because it's your birthday party. And you should invite people to come celebrate with you, not to let them pay to celebrate with you. So I don't see any abnormal thing in it. So I think it's normal for someone to pay and then go for So far as she's a star and then she wants her fans to come. So I think it's normal. Wow, well, I've never had to pay for a bed, to go for a birthday party. I was every if she's a celebrity. I mean, I know celebrities um, throw big parties, invite a lot of people free of charge to come and witness and stuff. So I don't, I don't think it's kind of awkward for me too. If it's a birthday party, it should be free. I don't see why you throw a party and then you charge a fee. What for? What is it going to come with? Are there any other special treatments or what? I don't get it. It's not acceptable. Like, um, it's the day which the person is remembering his birthday party. So, I mean, it should not be, or it should not put it in his mind that we should, uh, he should, or he or she should be collecting money before. Meanwhile, sources close to Sally have told uh, Showbiz, although the Sally is organizing an event on her birthday, which is September 27th, it is not a birthday uh, party as has been suggested. We're told the event it would, may indeed feature some housemates from the recent Big Brother Africa reality show, The Chase. That's it. Bye, we have Showbiz. <laughs>a mass grave at the Woodhome Cemetery here in Accra has set off an offensive, an offensive stench residents say is unbearable. Anglo Gold Ashanti, Goldfields, Ghana and five others have been indicted in an EPA report for their poor environmental practices. And Cocoa Board has signed an agreement for $1.2 billion to finance cocoa purchases. That's it for the bulletin. My name is Israel Lai. Have a great weekend.